Good evening. My name is Michelle Young Maplethorpe, and I'm Vice President for Global Artistic Programs, Director of the Asia Society Museum, and Artistic Director of the Asia Society Triennial. It's my pleasure to welcome you this evening to Asia Society for the panel discussion, Histories of the Present, Contemporary Korean Art in Context, with participating triennial artists Mina Chian, Kyung Ham, and Minuk Lim. This panel discussion is organized in conjunction with our inaugural Asia Society Triennial that just opened to the public on October 27th. For those of you who may not be familiar with the Triennial, it's the first recurring initiative in the United States with a mandate to champion Asian and Asian American contemporary artists within a global context. The Triennial provides an internationally recognized platform for these artists to push the boundaries of their respective practices and to meaningfully engage with audiences whom they may not otherwise encounter. The inaugural edition, We Do Not Dream Alone, features over 40 artists and artist groups working across mediums from 20 countries across Asia and the diaspora. This exciting new initiative will be viewed in two parts from October 27th to June 27th, 2021, and will be accompanied by a fully illustrated exhibition catalog and a robust roster of public programs. We really look forward to welcoming you back to Asia Society here in New York to encounter this exciting exhibition. And to learn more about how to visit the Triennial, please come visit our website at asiasociety.org front slash triennial. For those members who are tuning in this evening, we thank you for your steadfast support of our work, especially now. Your generosity nourishes our resolve to continue our important work despite these challenging times. And for those of you who are not yet members, we encourage you to get involved. Membership information may be viewed on our website at asiasociety.org front slash support front slash membership. The program this evening will include a presentation by each of the artists, followed by about 30 minutes of moderated dialogue and about five minutes of questions from the audience at the end of the evening. To submit a question, please send them through the comment or the chat sections of the Facebook and YouTube platforms that we're broadcasting from this evening. This program is being recorded and the conversation will be posted on our YouTube channel um, for further reference very soon after this evening's program. So at this time, it's my pleasure to introduce our esteemed panelists. First this evening, I'd like to introduce Mina Chian. She's a new media artist, scholar, educator, and activist, best known for her Paulette Pot paintings inspired by pop art and social realism. Chian's practice draws inspiration from the partition of the Korean Peninsula, exemplified by her parallel body of work created under the North Korean alter ego Kim Il-sun, in which she enlists a range of mediums including painting, sculpture, video installation, and performance to deconstruct and reconcile the fraught history and ongoing coexistence between North and South Korea. Chian has exhibited internationally, including at the Busan Biennale, the Baltimore Museum of Art, American University Museum at the Katzen Art Center in Washington, D.C., the Sunkook Art Museum in Seoul, and Insa Art Space Seoul. Her work is in the collections of the Baltimore Museum of Art, Smith College Museum of Art, and the Seoul Museum of Art as well. She is professor at the Maryland Institute of Col College of Art, and she received a BFA in painting from EY Women's University in Seoul in 1996, an MFA in painting from the Maryland Institute College of Arts in 1999, an MFA in imaging and digital art from the University of Maryland in 2002, and a PhD in philosophy of media and communications at the European Graduate School in uh, Sasfe, Switzerland in 2008. Next, it's my pleasure to introduce Kyunga Ham. Ham's multifaceted practice is driven by an interest in mapping the unseen power dynamics dictated by socio-political ideologies and subjective histories. She's best known for her embroidered canvases created in dialogue with anonymous North Korean artisans who convert Ham's coded messages and instructions into intricate embroideries. 
These are then smuggled back to the artists in South Korea to be integrated into a finished composition. You can actually see fantastic examples of these in the triennial. Um, and her provocatively collaborative works not only explore the societal impact of the partition of the Korean peninsula, but also the devastating consequences of politically imposed borders on societies. Ham has been the subject of numerous international exhibitions, including at the Center of Heritage Arts and Textile in Hong Kong, MSG Museum for Kunst and Queerweb in Hamburg, the Taipei Biennale, and the Liam Samsung Museum of Art in Seoul. She was a finalist for the 2011 Asia Pacific Brewery Signature Art Prize organized by the Singapore Art Museum and was nominated for the 2008 Rockefeller Bellagio Creative Arts Fellowship in New York. Her works are included in the collections of the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, the Liam Samsung Museum of Art in Seoul, the National Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Korea, and the Uli Sig Collection. Ham received a BFA from Seoul National University in 1989 and an MFA from the School of Visual Arts in New York in 1995. And finally this evening, it's my honor to present Minuk Lim. Minuk Lim's practice spans the genres of music, video, installation, writing, and performance art to expose and amplify narratives relating to the democratization and economic development of South Korea following the end of the Korean War. Her emotionally charged works filter perceptions of the present through the lens of pivotal moments in Korea's history as a means to confront personal and societal traumas. This poignant perspective aims to reveal what lies beneath the surface through an examination of the propensity of time to dilute memory and alter perception. Lim's work was included in the seminal Los Angeles County Museum of Arts exhibition, Your Bright Future, 12 Contemporary Arts from Korea, Artists from Korea in 2009. Her work has been exhibited internationally, including at the Lyon Biennale, the H.E. Triennale, the Taipei Biennial, Plateau at the Samsung Museum of Art in Seoul, the Kunst Halloween, Gwangju Biennale, and the Walker Center, uh, Walker Art Center in Minneapolis, the Liverpool Biennale, and the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tokyo, among others. Lim studied painting at the Ihua Women's University in Seoul and received a Félicitation DNSAP from the École Nationale Supérieure des Beaux-Arts in Paris in 1994. So please join me in welcoming Mina Chian for the first presentation this evening. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, in this panel about the Koreas, which happens to be my favorite subject. I'm honored to be in a panel with artists Im Minuk and Han Gyeong Ah, who I admire very much. Thank you and congrats to Michelle, Bun Hye, Ken, and all the artists for the powerful Asia Society Chinale Part One exhibition. I love how the exhibition shares the broad and brilliant Asia, as well as covering the uniquely divergent and diasporic Asian differences. For me personally, it was a chilling experience to see Imminuk's work as the first piece you walk into and Ham Gyeong As as the last piece you leave with when visiting the Chianale, as if to circumvent an entire Chianale art experience under the setting and discourse of the Korea problem. Seeing this, I'm reminded of our inheritance of our shared transhistoric, transgenerational trauma and provided by this commonality our unfortunate predicament being stuck and in desperate need of repair, resolution, and reconciliation passed down generationally. New spectacles arise with ongoing threats from North Korea with the blowing up of inter-Korean liaison office building at Kaesong on June 16th and the 75th anniversary workers party military celebration on October 10th parading new ICBMs. In South Korea, Will's pro democracy uproars, the consumption continues with riches and the lands. Frankly, I don't see much recent reconciliation efforts in a me first capitalist state, South Korea. Therefore, the arc of my work has been about sharing, streaming, communicating and dreaming. Unification and global peace as a kind of yearning for my country, 
my land, my people, my family. Since my artistic medium is my conscience, I share, therefore I am. While pre-COVID headlines related to North Korea was the buzz of Yo-Yo Ma performing at the heavily fortified DMZ on September 9, 2019, calling for peace and the building of bridges across cultures, the short-term effects of music, entertainment, or athletic competition to bridge peace on warfares feel unsatisfactory, relying on fabricated catharsis that cannot compensate 70 years of separation between Korean families. I think back to the moment I got to ride a bus right through the DMZ from South Korea to North Korea in 2004, visiting Kum Gang San. Back then, I could have never imagined the future when Trump gets to jump over to the other side, like jump roping or hopscotching. Nor did I see a future where a North Korean soldier who ran across the DMZ for his life and was shot wakes up from the surgeries in South Korea asking for a choco pie. So I've become a fan of peace and decided we must protest for peace by walking, dreaming, eating, and sharing. I walk for peace and global peace shoes, and so do so many of my friends around the world, since one foot cannot move without the other. The left cannot move without the right. I've started to dream unification where my North Korean art persona, Kim Il-sun, ventures into stencil work, spraying, tagging in her dreams of Korea's third flag, the unification flag in a new body of work of flag figurations that parades in procession, dreaming unification, protest peace. Tapping into her stream of unconsciousness to promote a future of unity and peace, flags are raised to celebrate one Korea. The protest for peace is done to offset the discouraging chaos and canceled peace talks in the peninsula. We each occupy together the food for art and healing, the South Korean manufactured chocolate marshmallow cookie cake that is worth three bowls of rice in North Korea and remains a strong currency in the black market and favored smuggled good there. The chocopai has become the symbol of love and exchange between the two Koreas. I've dedicated 100,000 chocopais to North Korean defectors, and they were consumed by art lovers and global peace lovers alike at the Busan Biennale in 2018. Taking a bite for global peace. For the Asia Society Trinale in New York, the physical installation event that was supposed to happen at the Lincoln Center past June went digital. To respond to our socially distanced time with the coronavirus, eatchocopietogether.com is a website created to allow people to stay connected by sending virtual chocopies to loved ones with custom messages. On the website, clicking on the map of Korea and selecting design packages with the theme of love, peace, share, eat and unite references things we need right now, whether we are in divided Korea or in the United States of America. And each participation of sharing the pies automatically raise funds for the Korean Americans affected by the coronavirus through the Korean American Community Foundation COVID-19 Action Fund. Lastly, as a way to call on peace streaming for unification from dream worlds to the underground world, I've sent contemporary video art history lessons into North Korea through USB drives and SD cards for the last couple of years with the help of North Korean refugee activists in South Korea utilizing a larger global activism effort known as information media penetration. I do this with love and with the message to North Koreans that I love you and the world loves you. The video series include 10 short videos showcasing art history lessons produced similar to children's educational TV shows on Marshall Duchamp, Andy Warhol, Ai Weiwei, Mark Bradford, Nam Jung Pek, Peng Nam Jun, Shirin Nashad, Kim Suja, many others, and focuses on topical themes of modern and Korean contemporary, um, excuse me, modern and contemporary art, such as art, food, reproduction, feminism, social justice, and the environment. The real message, however, is about the human rights for education. From other histories of secluded countries, hermit kingdoms, totalitarian societies that too have opened up from Arab Spring to the foreseeable Pyongyang Spring, it is possible to rise up from within with media in one hand and freedom in the other. My extended work I now call asynchronous communication with North Korean citizen is to be further presented alongside the videos in Notel Players for the upcoming part two of Asia Society Trinale exhibition opening March 16th, 2021. From the divided Koreas to the divided United States of America, desiring peace over there echoes desiring peace over here. While another pandemic lockdown looms over us, 
Art must continue as a banner of hope and as essential in life. Peace out, thank you. Thank you so much, Mina, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'd love to ask Kyunga Han to speak now, if you uh, begin your presentation. Thank you for the time today. Mm, I'm going to directly tell about uh, my uh, my work. Okay. The, uh, impetus behind the embroidery project came from a personal experience when I randomly came up on propaganda flyers from North Korea under the gate of my parents' house. Upon the encounter with this vestige of the Cold War era and without knowing where or when they could have landed on my periphery, I began to think about ways of communicating with the anonymous people in the North by using art as a medium to actualize the concerned proclaimed enemy state. However, it was almost a surreal and an, a nearly impossible task for a, an ordinary citizen like me. Given the hostile state of affairs between the two countries, there were no immediately available routes or agencies for this kind of exchange. Undeterred by these difficult circumstances, I continued to think about what could be sent. And the first thing that crossed my mind was to deliver the stories from the greater world outside to the people in North Korea. Contrary to many of us living in a highly digitalized world, where all sort of informations are available just a mouse click away, the lives above the demarcation line belongs to that of uh, one of the most uh, hermetic countries in the world. I began to collect the news and images uh, circulating on the internet and thought about the ways to transfer these uh, fragments of digital information into a medium most uh, uh, um, antithetical to their origin. The information bite by bite would be translated into stitch by stitch and hand woven in embroidery. The epitome of the most um, analog labor intensive medium. I would, I would recompose a set of appropriated imageries and add a phrase extracted from the world news, which with a dose of humor had been translated into North Korean dialect and rendered in calligraphic font. The result would then be printed out to true to the size of the calligraphic font. The result, um, uh, the actual work and sent to the North Korea uh, via the middleman. The middleman's role was crucial in that it required high discretion as they uh, directly delivered the prints to the artisans in North Korea via a third country or traveled to the areas near the border to hand over and then bring them back once they have been completed. The entire process was this peculiar artist communication required an espionage film-like curation, whereby the digitally processed text and image through the collaborative uh, hands of anonymous middlemen and artisans get transferred into an analog form. The first round of 11 prints I had sent North ended up getting confiscated by the North Korean government's security control by the time they were uh, nearly finished. Although the first batch could be considered a failure as the works couldn't make it back to my hands. I suspect that artisans were able to spend enough time reading the text over and over again during the time they worked with them. In that sense, I was quite successful in actualizing the conceptual backbone of the work at the very least. At a later day, I showed a machine rendered simulation of these works at an exhibition to show what they would have looked like had they made their way back to my studio. 
I would like to imagine that these artisans whom I'm not allowed to see or meet would have, have had the time to solitarily dis, uh, decipher the hidden allegory as they spent long hours with these texts and images. And that perhaps these images and phrases, like a seed of imagination implanted on this falling land, would have spread in their phantom-like presence. The capricious state of world politics would cast many uh, variables, often exposing these works to the uh, peril, peril of confiscation and demand for bribery at times, uh, resulting in the disappearance of the middlemen. The dangers embedded in the process provide circumstantial uh, evidence and blueprint for the reality that the two Koreas are facing where uh, physical travel is barred and ideological conflict persists with the bigger uh, scheme of world history. As the work's caption denotes the invisible mediums behind the process, such as middlemen, uh, smuggling, bribe, anxiety, censorship, confiscation, ideology, and secret code, as well as uh, illegality, patience, and chance continue, uh, constitute the line motif behind the embroidery project. The outcome, a visible object as an embroidery with a aesthetic dimension will continue to evolve as it acquires at a layer of meanings based on the imagination of the viewers encountering the work. And so the phantom footsteps would continue on. I once saw a documentary film about Arirang Festival, which is one of the biggest festivals commemorating the birth of North Korea's first leader, leader Kim Il-sung. The highlight of the festival was so-called socialist mass game and car section, which is a human billboard performed by thousands of school children collectively, creating large propaganda images in mosaic by holding up color card. The performance required great seed and coordination. At one moment, the camera zoomed in for a close-up view and captured a young boy who was a part of the performance. The boy was taking a quick glance at the director in front and quickly hid behind the color card. I was struck by this split scene, uh, second scene. It was a moment where the boy was reduced to a segment or a pixel of a giant image of gone. In my chandelier project, countless number of tiny stitches that are nearly invisible from a certain distance exist behind the large image of chandelier to face the world, uh, just like the schoolboy behind the card. The large flamboyant chandeliers uh, seemingly exude a powerful aura of the Western superpower that have formed the axis of world history. Paradoxically speaking, the chandeliers also serve as a reminder of the tragic history born out of the Western century worldview. The five cities mentioned in the works, the title allude to the cities where the big no uh, nations have held conferences to discuss and sign treaties on the division of and the subsequent um, trusteeship over the uh, Korean peninsula. The Chandelier project, a result of the impossible collaboration between the South Korean artists and North Korean embroidery artisans, uh, reminds us of the tragic Korean history behind Korea's division and world history at large. The chandeliers in my work appear to be screwed or fallen to the ground, creating a metaphor for failed uh, ideologies and the flickering faint light connotes uh, the ongoing conflict, tension and burden uh, between the North and the South. And um, in the SMS series sending um, yeah, you can see the old uh, chandelier works. And uh, this is the SMS series. 
this and the SMS uh, sending message service series is such potentially ironic messages as are you lonely to money never sleeps, big smiles, greed is good and imagine have been uh, camouflaged into lavish abstract images. The work obscure text and so far as possible. Again, show. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kyunga. That was wonderful. So our final presentation this evening will be by Minuk Lim. So Minuk, please go ahead. Thank you. Hi. Um, yeah, it's Minuk Lim. Uh, I'm very, uh, uh, thank you, Michelle. And I'm very honored to be here with Mina Chan and Han Byung Ah. So I would start uh, my presentation from uh, Newtown Ghost. So this work is the first single channel video that I made, which demonstrates, uh, which demonstrates one of the pivotal moments in my earth. Settling in Korea after living in Paris for 13 years, I was looking for a new home, but the year 2005 was quite challenging for me in many levels. So the work Newtown Ghost was produced uh, with the idea of alienation and nostalgia. Then the concept of discontinuity and contingency propelled me to create the video installation and performative object as well. So my first solo exhibition, Jump Cut, as you see here, has raised the questions of what should I do to live in your world? Considering the 2008 global financial crisis that I lived through and the, the apocalyptic atmospheres arising from climate change and this urgency. In 2010, I introduced the thermographic camera for the first time to incorporate nighttime records in my work. The weight of hands as images, which is a performance-based video. Heat and shadow were the subject of my method, which detect and map out cartography of other things. Photo Keeper series was started in 2009. They are composed of abandoned objects they, that were collected from an old town that was destroyed due to gentrification. Everyday objects or organic goods like squid bones, feathers, thorns, or even Crystallized drops of glues are all entangled together in that pivotal body of objects. And I consider these creatures as vehicles or morning objects. The installation composed of a video and object in series attempts to expand the testimony through what I call tactile vision and take out performance. My art practice usually starts from a small episode or coincidence, and the research comes after, the, after to reconstruct a record or a fiction. I'm more driven those intuitive experience that are beyond the logic or concept. The possibility of the half Navigation ID and the promise of it all introduces the idea of broadcasting system. These works were initiated by three major media events that are still deeply ingrained in memories of my youth. 
The first event was when the former president Park jong hee was assassinated. The second one is the Finding Dispersed Family Program. And the last is the artist Nam Junpek's Good Morning, Mr. Orwell satellite event that happened in 1984. The media's role in those moments by displaying such scenes of funeral events, mourning places, and impossible meeting points and the satellite show all seem to connect different times and spaces. For me, it was the first aesthetical media experience of the irreversible crossway other than the history. And it was starting like that my broadcasting station's idea as universal, um, as a universal ritualistic space. How to disappear to join the disappeared dream? In this sense, I believe that Asia Society's sculptural object I presented for, uh, first presented in 2015 at the promise of Eve signify that the moments of separation do not mean the end, but rather can become a guide that brings us to another open time frame, open time frame, and helps us dream together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Munich. That was great. Um, so I think we'll start jumping into um, some questions that we talked a little bit about beforehand. So I think as each of you has alluded in your respective presentations, um, you know, the separation of North and South Korea has had a deep impact on your practices. And each of you has grown up in the generation where um, you, know, you have not known a unified Korea. Um, and so I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit, you know, this focus on the societal impact of the partition of North and South Korea. Um, is that something that you feel is a deep-seated societal influence on people's everyday lives? And, and that's why you focus on this topic in your work? Um, if you could elaborate a little bit on how kind of um, the larger social environment, you know, if, it, if you, how that decide, how that influenced you to focus on these, um, on this subject. I mean, I think, you know, you alluded that to that specifically, Manuk, in your work about these kind of three seminal moments. Um, and, you know, you mentioned that they had a direct impact on you. But did you feel that that also had a larger societal impact um, on your peers of your generation? Um, you know, for example, the displaced, finding displaced families um, from 1985. Well, I'm sorry, there are certain, uh, in, um, it became a quite uh, uh, difficult to listen, uh, inter internet problem maybe, so there was some... Oh, the so oh. I, uh, maybe Minuk, to rephrase, I will direct it to you first. Um, can you hear me okay now? Right now, yes, yes. So I was talking about how um, each of you has grown up in the generation that has only known Korea to be divided between North and South. And, you know, in your respective presentations, your work largely deals with this subject of um, the impact of the separation of North and South. And, in, I was referencing Minuk specifically, you were saying that there were three key moments in history that affected and influenced your practice. So I was wondering specifically with the Finding Displaced Families um, broadcast, you know, that deeply impacted you, but do you feel that that also reverberated across society? And so do you feel, do each of you feel, I guess, that when when you're 
when your work is out in the world that um, people know your points of reference, I guess, from this shared history. So do I answer first? Yes, if you would like to answer first and then maybe Mina, if you could follow with your uh, answer to the same question. I mean, uh, those subjects uh, influenced deeply yeah, the way I create my work, but most of, uh, um, uh, how to say, as an artist living in a divided country, my main obsession became almost to fight against binary thinking. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I think um, it, it is it became important for my words to portray some sort of um, uncanny moment. Mm -hmm. And I think in that way, it reflects modernity and and socio-political, cultural identity of Korea. Uh, and like that, I believe my work can distance itself from any categorization or even provide a certain sense of in-between. This is very, became very important. I don't know if I <laughs> uh, answered yeah. to your questions. Yeah. I'd like to listen, Mina, maybe. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, I mean, oh, thank you. Yeah. Sure. Uh, uh, thank you, Imino um, I think for me, uh, wait a second, do we, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, I have very sort of dispersed memory of um, family members talking about the war, uh, before the war, and um, this kind of lived experience that gets passed down through storytelling. And it's always dispersed because you hear about, you know, family members who either uh, have come from the north or were born in the northern regions, you know, their experience, their separation through the war. And, um, you know, it's, it's a kind of everyday, very intimate stories that are often kind of tossed um, without a, a real seriousness. And I think it's that Koreans live having lived through the, uh, the war and um, even prior to that, sort of the post-colonial uh, colonization from Japan, going through those traumas, they don't really articulate uh, their histories fully. It's not like they're gonna uh, see, uh, sit you down and tell you the entire, um, their version of it. So I get these kind of dispersed uh, storytelling in my life and then having lived outside of Korea half my life now. There's a kind of sense of urgency to reclaim um, a, a kind of hypersensitivity towards uh, being Korean. And um, I think it's probably because I'm, you know, I spend more time outside of Korea where um, my interest uh, is peaked. And I probably talk about it a bit more than other people or especially <laughs> Koreans in Korea do. Um, but I feel like there is the always the outside and the inside perspective and um, globally the the stories of Korea are very um, very much continued propaganda of the post uh, Cold War and I, I really um, you know love uh, both of Im Minook and Ham Gyeonga's work because it it kind of displays that um, and reflect sort of, you know, how it's received uh, from the standpoint of, of being in Korea and the disparities between the, um, the differences of what is being promoted and uh, what is being mediated. And the one thing that I've been able to um, find useful is being inside and outside of Korea the stories that gets revealed, you know, the, the urgency of what's going on, the, the media and journalism seems to prioritize different things. I think, you know, North Korea is the axis of evil at, at one point was um, 
a big contrast to my experience of visiting North Korea, even though it was just Kim Gang San, it's just how familiar and, uh, you know, familial it was um, to be there. And um, it, that became part of my storytelling to be able to talk about the difference. Um, and I really value being able to be in a bit of a, a milieu with people like Kyung Ah or uh, Minuk Sansanyim Du because uh, you know you've set a kind of precedence and I'm able to teach my students even today when I teach Korean art history how um, artists you know with their kind of individual agency can um, present the the various and uh, different narratives that usually gets washed out with um, propaganda. So it's it's been very helpful for me to be able to share that. Yeah. Thank you, Nina. I um I guess I would turn it then now to Kyunga and Minuk with this um, point that. Um, you can hear me, right? Um, the point of that Mina made in her remarks just now about Sorry. inside and outside, um, and both of you. <laughs> Sorry. Hello. <laughs> um, you know, both Kyunga and Minuk, you both spent quite some time outside of Korea as well. And I wonder for you, was there, um, you know, spending that time away and outside of this society, um, you know, in this kind of in this more binary space, um, did that change your perception of um, what was going on in, you know, it going on in Korean society or kind of changed your perspective on um, recent history? I mean, again, Kind of taking what Mina was saying about whether you're inside Korea or outside, the narrative is different and the perception is different. And I wonder if that has colored your um, practice or the way that you consider uh, the thematics that you're working with differently. Sangha, do you want to start? Mm -hmm. So can I can I maybe um, tell you something? Yeah, uh, but in Korean and yes, of course. Okay. And I will translate. Um, 제가 uh, 미국에 있을 때그 사실 어 두어 번 한국에서 전쟁이 날 거라는 소문이 되게 많이 돌았어 가지고 그럴 때마다 가족한테 전화를 하고 어. 그때는 인터넷도 거의 쓰지 않는 때라서 <웃음> 국제 전화도 되게 비쌌는데 어 하, 한국에 전화를 할 때마다 가족들이 무슨 봉창 두들기는 소리를 하느냐 이상한 소리를 한다고 해서 꾸중을 많이 들었었는데 실제로 이 이때 어 미국 대통령의 최종 사인만 남긴 상태로 이게 통과되면 한국에서 전쟁이 일어날 수도 있는 상황이었었다라는 걸 나중에 알았었고 어뭐 어, 그, 이렇게 외국에 사, 살기 때문에, 살았기 때문에 한국에서 느끼는 그런 그 오히려 남북 문제는 굉장히 상투적인 문제나 그 오래된 어떤 그, 늘 있어 왔던 어떤 그런 거였기 때문에 그렇게 긴장감을 어, 외국에서 사는 상태보다 덜 갖게 되는 것 같아요. 그래서, 어, 음, when I was a Korean student studying in America, there was this rumor among Korean students and the Korean society in the U.S. that another war, Korean war, would break out soon in Korea. Every time I heard something, I would call my family in Korea, uh, very anxious. But back in the days, uh, it wasn't very easy to access the internet or make international calls. So I tried to hold my anxieties until it burst out and I, call, I would call my parents and they would in turn get mad at me for being outrageous. 
it turned out there were actually a few occasions when the war was imminent with a, only a final call from the president of the United States. Uh, but in, in reality, after all these experiences, um, I realized that the issues of the Koreas within Korea, it's, it's almost um, as if it's banal and it doesn't feel as tensed if you live within um, South Korea. So, can I, can I say? <laughs> yeah, uh, I think uh, your question was uh, how it, uh, my experience of living away from Korea affected or shifted my perspective of um, and relationship to Korean modern history and Korean society, right? Um, Yes, I, I would say for um, the way of seeing, questioning more what is present or absent, wishing and longing, etc. Finally, more being visionary and dreaming inevitably. But if I can tell you um, a bit more my, uh, about my study years in France, it, have, it has awakened my way of thinking about democracy, human rights, and revolution, invention, etc. I, I was touched by their freedom of expression, fraternity, and solidarity. More particularly, I was impressed with their profound love and pride for their own culture and art, and their attitude to preserve those values. Because Korea experienced a long period of colonization and it was the loss of memory that was truly irrevocable after the Korean War due to plundering and destruction of records. But, but when I came back to Korea, I became more aware of smallest things, potential things, friendship, etc. And especially my parents' generation and separated family, dispersed families who suffered the, the war and colonization starting from ground zero in the ruins. They, they devoted their whole lives only for the future and reinvented themselves. They exhausted everything to protect their children from the war experience and to organize themselves. In a sense, I, we can, I can say I, I learned, learned a deep lesson in that, that they live their life by not solely relying on what they already know and experienced. So maybe, um, um, that's why since uh, 2005, many thoughts on parting, mourning, and death have affected my practice, but it is not about simply providing a this lesson or the message. In this age of pandemics, I feel more, but I feel more um, justified in making a sense, of making a reason by thinking of a new, new category with the category of ecology, I would say. Thank you, that's a um, great comment. And I guess, Minyuk, if we could continue on that strain with you first. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, there is some... Again, something. Yeah. Okay, so if we could continue on that strain, you know, you're talking about this idea of a greater sense of freedom and solidarity and also thinking of your work to serve as some, you know, to provide some kind of catharsis through this sense of mourning or of a passing. Um, I would think maybe back to our, the question we had talked about, the second question we were talking about, 
thinking who is your audience who is your ideal do you have an ideal audience that you're speaking to is it this older generation who have gone through so much is it um you know people outside of korea who may not understand this deep seated poignancy in history as you know those in inside korea korean society who have lived it and who have, have kind of um um not embodied it but they've kind of ingested it into their the soul of their being in that way um who you know do you have a an ideal audience that you're speaking to and what kinds of messages are you trying to convey or or a sense that, that you want to provide them is it catharsis um oh yes i i i do think i do think of a particular audience i don't think. um and um but my special audiences are not only human beings or nature, so they can create a certain atmosphere or movement. I mean, for example, I like the idea of a special guest or a special messenger, some mm. very special visitors passing through in the middle, or uh, they, they generate, they are generated in, in between. I don't know if I <laughs> explain well. So they can, but I like this idea because they can shake up the preconception and generate the tension. Mm -hmm. I hope, I used to hope they could empower like that, empower the imagination for different ways of coexistence. As my, mm -hmm. For example, my, my sculptural objects and videos are rebuilt up from fragmented and deconstructed things from objects of different origins, right? And, and this way of self-organization will, I hope, protect the freedom that is so fragile. Uh, the, yes, this is my imagination or of, about the uh, special guest. <laughs> Maybe um, I would like to listen uh, more from Gyeonga or Mina. Okay. Well, Their special that. audience. <laughs> I'll turn the question to you next, Mina, because I think sure you have uh, both with your persona of Kim Il Sung and you know your direct kind of when you're sending your when you're more activist work, sending the flash drives to North Korea or kind of this idea of um, disseminating the chocolate pies, like, are, do you feel that a big part of your work is a direct discourse with um, the, your North Korean counterparts? Or I guess, who is your ideal audience in terms of? Yeah, I'd like to um, continue with what Minok Sensenyim is saying about the, the audience um, imaginary I think I started my um, reading of the text that I put together with a kind of awakening of our similarities, our commonalities, and that we, you know, we can't escape the trans historic and transgenerational situation that we're in. And the reason we're making the kind of work that we are is because of our um, previous his history and and just sort of um, our inheritance of sort of our lives and our current situation. So it's definitely, we have the past behind us, but we are certainly responding to our time now. And when I think of um, the audience, it's very uh, multi-pronged. It can't be singular. Like sometimes I, I, depending on parts of the project, I'm definitely thinking about North Koreans. I'm thinking about North Korean artists. Sometimes I'm thinking about North Korean women. Um, but the conversation stems from, you know, what it means to be a human being, a mother, or, you know, just sort of my own life and the continuation of what gets passed down. And, you know, I, I've, I have some sad stories that when I listen to it, 
it really, um, you know, it kind of freezes me up when I think about, you know, cause hang, you know, like, you know, what my parents went through, my grandparents went through. And the kind of stories that gets told, you know, my father receiving uh, chocolate from American so soldiers wrapped in gold, like that's the, you know, the symbol of Imperial United States. It comes in gold, or it's wrapped in gold, right? Chocolate that you get to taste. And my mother talks about um, her father who would cry because he had to leave his parents um, in the North and this kind of, you know, severe fracturing, just knowing about it is, um, quite painful. And when I think about, um, my children now who also continued with this kind of Korean diaspora and really their, you know, their existence brings me to a kind of, you know, returning to, um, addressing some of those issues of pain. It might be very kind of, you know, more recently American to deal with restoration or, you know, repair. And I've, I've kind of brought up those language. They're like kind of buzzwords these days. You know, this is, this is the kind of mode that we're in. But somehow I felt like as an artist that that could be in my vocabularies and in my language. And so whether I'm thinking of the North Koreans and sending videos to them, I make these art history lessons and that's really what I could do. I could teach art history lessons and I, I could teach. And that's all I've been doing for 20, 30 years is making lessons, right? And so that's what I could give. And then when I get any form of return, it's such a gift but I'm also thinking about my students. I'm thinking about the generation of what they're learning. And then I'm thinking about the audience who, you know, um, walk into a gallery or a museum, what kind of an awareness they could have about Korea that's a little more intimate and, you know, a not so boxed in. So I, I feel like I'm, I'm, you know, working at multiple levels you know, it would be naive to say I have a singular audience, like your work can never really, you know, is not meant for a single view or, you know, there's this kind of multi um, level operation going on. Um, and going back to Imanuk um, you know, the future guest or the imaginary, I think there is space for that, you know, the unknown or um, with COVID-19, we talk about the undead because we can't mourn people who have died properly. And we're, as artists, we're able to make that space between life and death and everything in between. And, you know, it could be, um, you know, a little bit of uh, spiritual or shamanic in nature. It could be a little bit of magic, but it is something else than what sort of Western logo, um, centrism, you know, tells us or teaches us. So it is something other than that. And I, I think that becomes a huge part of the way that we make work and we share and, um, and what we expect in future audiences. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you. Sandra, would you like to contribute any thoughts um, to this part of the conversation of our audience? Um. 첫째, 어, 저에게는 그, 그 자스 프로젝트라면서 만남이 불가능하고 북한 노동자들과 이제 온그 유일하게 시각적인 텍스트로 또는 시각적 텍스트, 텍스트와 시각적인 어떤 그 사이의 방법으로 추상적인 소통을 하고 있었는데 그 제가 던진 메시지를 오랜 시간 동안 그 노동 집약적인 그런 긴 시간 동안 어, 접하고 이야기를 곱씹고 또 상상의 나래를 펴서 또는 이 이야기가 그 북한의 어떤 뭐 판톰 풀스텝이라고 제가 부르는데 어떤 씨앗이 돼서 어떤 소문이 퍼져 나간다든가 한국 상황에서 뭐그 슬랭이나 이런 것들이 제가 거기에 적어서 작업을 했을 때뭐뭐 뭐 이쪽 상황에서는 뭐 
반가 반가를 이런 식으로 얘기한다든가 젊은이들 사이에서 은밀하게 퍼져나갈 수 있다든가 보이지 않는 그 어, 그러나 존재할 수 있는 미래의 어떤 그 대상들 그런 거는 잡히지 않는 어떤 어, 어, 번져나갈 수 있는 그런 소문들 어, 이런 주체로서의 어떤 제 작업의 어, 주체이자 소비자인 북한 노동자들이 음, 가장 중요한 어떤 그 대상일 수가 있겠고 두 번째는 관객입니다. 저를 포함한 관객들 그 북한 노동자들이 해온 어떤 그런 날것들을 가지고 그 다시 그 날것의 신성함을 경험하고 또 이런 불가능한 또는 불가시성적인 걸 통해서 어떤 보이지 않는 존재들을 자수지의 존재들을 상상을 하고 그 다음에 그 상상과 그 어떤 노동의 결과를 보면서 음, 어, 이쪽 어, 그 북한이 아닌 다른 지역에서 작업을 감상하는 사람들이 이 작업을 완성하는 주체가 될수 있겠고 또한 어떤 이런 금기라는 것을 통해서 어, 환상과 어떤 일루전, 환영들 이런 것들이 어떤 욕망을 자극하고 부각시키면서 새로운 뭐 가치에 대한 질문을 그 표면으로 떠오르게 하면서 그뭐 콜렉터나 또는 예술 시장에서의 어떤 가치라는 것에 대해서 또는 금기와 욕망과 뭐그 일루전과 이런 것들이 어떻게 어, 드러날 수 있는지에 대한 어떤 그 질문도 어, 중요하고 그들 역시 어떤 대상이 돼서 이 모두가 어, 제 작업을 완성하는 대상이 된다고 생각을 하고 소비자이자 어, 소비 소비의 주체이자 또는 객체가 될수 있다고 생각을 합니다. 어, 생산자가 될 수도 있고. The three things that I want to highlight uh, when I make my work, I first think about the North Korean embroiderers, of course, who are the invisible collaborators of this project, but I never get to see meet them, as I said. Uh, I only communicate with them visually or through text or somewhere in between, uh, almost as an abstract mode of communication. I would like to imagine that these embroiderers would have had the chance to personally, personally encounter these abstract images and the um, slang terms that I've embedded in these images, the text, um, and think about the stories behind and engage in their own imagination as they spent many hours transforming my blueprint into these labor-intensive embroideries. Mm -hmm. In the end, uh, I would hope that the, these messages would, uh, imagination after imagination, sort of spread as a rumor and trigger all these imaginations among the people in North Korea. It's my hope. And secondly, I think about my audience when I make these works. Uh, the, it, that also includes me, myself, and all the subjects who get to experience the extraordinary handi handicraft by these em embroiderers and how it is also the physical manifestation of what started out as an abstract idea. In the end, the viewers complete the work with their imagination about the nearly impossible journey the work has taken and all the invisible people that have taken part in its making. It's also in the beholder's eyes to recognize and understand the validity and possibility and invisibility of the production process. Lastly, uh, the invisible mediums of my work also emphasize taboo, fantasy, illusion, and desire, prompting us to think about the value system. In other words, you could also think about how it gets circulated in the art market. And, um, Roughly saying, in a bigger scheme of things, I believe all of these subjects I have just mentioned become both a producer and a consumer of my work at the same time. Wonderful. Thank you so much. There's so many things I would still like to ask you. I mean, we've only, I feel like, just scratched the surface, but unfortunately, we've already gone past our time. So I hope that you have one more thing that you would like to say, Kanga. Yeah, something I experienced oh, okay. yeah. about Picasso in Korea. <laughs> Good. 
I, I tell her in Korean, uh, Picasso라는 물감이 있었는데 그 브랜드 이름이 피카소였는데 다 알다시피 피카소가 공산당원이었고 그 다음에 피카소가 그렸던 한국 어, 어, 한국전쟁이라는 작품이 있는데 이 작품조차 피카소가 어, 그 CIA의 어떤 엑스파일에 올라있고 조사 대상이고 그, 그로 그 인해서 그 피카소가 그린 한국전쟁도 어, 우리나라에서 소개가 어, 굉장히 오랫동안 되, 되지 못했고 어, 이 피카소의 한국전쟁도 어, 유럽의 어느 나라의 내전 어, 독립을 위한 내전 어, 내에서 포스터로 쓰여졌기 때문에 그런 부분도 더 같이 어, 합해지면서 이 어, 소위 그 크레파스 아이들이 그 가장 어렸을 때 그림 그리는 크레파스 이름이 피카소였는데 그 피카소라는 이름 자체를 어, 쓰지 못하게 해서 나중에 피닉스로 그 정부에서 어, 바꾸라고 해서 피닉스라는 <웃음> 이름의 크레파스가 만 프린스, 프린스, 왕자파스 Not Phoenix, Wanda Passen. Yeah. Just a uh, small, short incident that I want to talk about. Uh, when I was it's young, it's, it's a very funny story. There, it, there used to be a color pencil brand called Picasso. And because Picasso was labeled as a communist in Korea, and he had also painted the subject of Korean War, which was banned from being introduced in Korea for a while, uh, the government in the end asked the brand to change it, the, the name of the brand to Phoenix. And um, she thought it was a very humorous episode from her childhood to uh, add on to her answers from the second question. Ah, uh, yes, about the influence. Yes, and, and your your experiences from your youth. No, thank you for that nice anecdote. It's very humorous. Um, any last words from Nina or Minou before we sign off? No? Yeah? No? Uh, I'd like to just, uh, I, I do want to thank uh, some refugees that I've met in South Korea. Um, and I, I feel like the they are the most hulyunge in so many respects because they work so hard to acclimate right um and i met some um like defectors outside in the U united states and stuff but those who are in south korea i feel have a harder time because the standards and the um the sense of displacement in your own country, but, you know, having gone through the war, it's quite different than the reception and the opportunities in the United States. It's a very different situation, but I really admire them and respect them. And um, I've been trying really hard to do a kind of advocacy. And I don't know how um, far it reaches, but I'm starting to think about Korea as a figure, like I'm the, it's like, Maybe it's from a painting background, but it's a kind of advocacy for um, the health and well-being of our, our place. So, yeah, and I think it all starts with our acceptance of the other. Yeah. Thank you, Nina. I mean, again, I think that we've only really been able to scratch the surface. I mean, each of your practices is so profound and so transformative and I feel like you know we'll have to have another conversation together to you know kind of get even deeper and and to share the profoundness and you know um, the power of your voices and you know the influence that you use your work as a vehicle to talk about these much larger issues that not you know, not only affect Korean society, but I feel affect all of us and impact all of us um, as um, you know, other humans. So thank you all again for your time and for waking up so early in Korea. And those of you um, at home and on Facebook and YouTube, thank you for joining us this evening. I hope you uh, enjoyed the evening conversation. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. <laughs>